Welcome back to the garden. This is part two of a very thorough garden tour here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're going through and showing off the plants that we had shown in previous videos going in the ground and uh, how they've performed in the garden over the last uh, couple of years. Most everything out here has been in the ground three years or less. Uh, they've all performed quite well. We did a lot of soil prep here, uh, you know, so that there was a, they, they had a very good footing. Uh, underneath them if you want to go back and look at any of this series of videos it's in a playlist called new house and there's old the very first video shows what it looked like before we ever started this project so we're going to jump in on a little tucked in corner up under a red bud that we finished the last video with so this is a pretty shady space most of the time over here it's a little dry this red bud is a little greedy and some of the things over here uh, have struggled a bit uh, because of how dry this area stays and we tend if we, when we we don't do a heck of a lot of watering but when we water we tend to forget about this space a little bit so that's an issue as well and we'll start with a kind of a funny one uh, this is a hosta next to the tree and it's not going to look like much we left a lot of space for it there as you can see because it's supposed to be one of the largest hostas in the garden but of course the roots from that red bud have really stolen the water from it we're not giving any additional water so that thing will get popped out of the ground and move somewhere else and we'll come up with some sort of dry shade ground cover for that close uh, to the tree it happens uh you know that, that's part that's part of gardening is finding out you know uh, holly is going to definitely be in the video a few times here uh, this hosta is called Liberty, a uh, really striking one. We've got a couple broken things over here on the side. And so we've had a deer come in from, we're not that far from a college and a greenway system. And we, and we, despite being in a very urban spot right near downtown Raleigh, we do still get the occasional deer wander through here. And uh, I think that that's what stepped on a few things that we'll see on this little side space. There's an elephant ear that's quite happy, and I would think as dry as it is over here, it wouldn't have been. Uh, it should, it's stunting it a bit. It probably should be a little bit larger than that at this point, but it's not stunting it you know, all that much. It's, it's managed to fight through it. Uh, one other hosta, uh, this is Cyboliana elegans. This is one of the larger growing uh, one of the larger growing hosta, and it's been used in a lot of breeding for other, you know, very, very large hosta. It has a kind of a bluish green tint to it. It's another one that's in flower. A lot of our hosta, uh, we showed several in the first tour video, are in, in flower right now. Some are fragrant, some are not. Uh, it's one of those, you know, one of those things with hosta. You, if you want fragrant hosta, you might want to look and make sure that the varieties that you're buying uh, are, in fact, uh, are, in fact, fragrant ones. This hydrangea was already here. Uh, it came from uh, a neighbor, it was a cutting from a neighbor originally, and it's bloomed quite well. That December freeze did a lot of damage to a lot of the hydrangea macrophyllas in the area and a lot of people's where it, you know, these carry the buds through the winter and they got damaged in that December freeze. This one is in a more protected space and so it didn't take much damage. And in fact, several others that we'll talk about in just a minute are doing okay, but this one, because of its maturity and because of its protected space, you know, definitely did the best. It's got to be reined in a bit. Uh, at some point, we'll, you know, do some pruning on it. The only, you know, a very brief period of time here where we can prune this and still get it to reset flower buds. There's a Pieris here. This is Temple Bells, just a great white flowering Pieris. It was actually in the front uh, garden and uh, wasn't thriving. So it just got moved back here not that long ago. It hasn't really started to put on any well, actually, I can see where it's budded up and it's about to start growing. The new growth on those are really kind of a bright red color, and then you get those white dangling flowers uh, in the uh, late winter, uh, very late winter. That This is another plant that would like a slightly more moist conditions for sure. Same thing on the back line back there. Holly's well involved in the video now. Uh, same thing on the one we have back on the back line. We have another variety that we'll see later, but it has finally fought through. Some of these things, if you can get them to, you know, that first year or so, uh, you know, to get through the fact that they're in a slightly drier area than they want to be, they can fight through. Some things just won't. Uh, this is a Lakotha wheat out here on the front. It's actually a variegated one uh, called Bohemian Beauty. Definitely one of the plants that took a little more damage in December than other things, and it just has not come out of it. Uh, all that well uh, so far. It's not a bad looking little low growing shade plant at this point, but I've lost some of the variegation in it and it's just, it's a bit stunted 
uh, from, the, from the damage that it took in December. We'll see. One of the plants that absolutely thrives in these dry shade conditions are hellebores, and we have a lot of hellebores in this garden. You know, one of the things, you know, we always want to force, you know, things that we want, either, you know, th th things that don't want the cold that we have or things where it's too, it's too hot for where we're trying to put them, it's too dry for where we're trying to put them, it's too wet for where we're trying to put them. Sometimes you just have to go with what your garden will allow you to do. And so uh, this hellebore is an absolutely perfect example of a plant that would a absolutely thrives under in this condition, under this red bud and with the root competition of an established tree has no problem at all competing with that. The hydrangea behind it is one that we got from uh, Dr. Durr. We have three Durr hydrangeas in these back garden uh, videos. These were ones that didn't make the cut for uh, uh, for release, um, you know, for patent and release. And so, you know, he, he, he gave them to us, you know, as, as part of filming down there with him and, and you know, uh, really have enjoyed getting to know him over time. Underwatered, <laughs> that's why you're seeing a flower this big instead of this big at this point. So another one that's fighting through, it just went in the ground uh, not that long ago. So it won't, you know, this season it'll get self-rooted in and next year we'll see larger flowers. We may see some larger flowers before the season's over because these are repeat blooming ones. I got another one behind me, I'll show you in a second. This plant is a club moss or selaginella. There are actually a lot of species of selaginella, and for the last year or so, um, I've just wondered how I just kind of missed these my whole 30-some years in this business. I mean, I see them, but they ju I just didn't pay that much attention to them. They're just great plants, and I was over in Berlin at the Botanic Garden in Berlin recently, and just they have a, a species collection of selaginella, and there's just tons of them. Some are, some are hardy here, some are not. Uh, just fantastic, uh, great, great plants. And it's, it's just hit the ground running in this dry shade condition. I would have thought it would have wanted more moisture. Somehow it's just done fine. And look how much it has spread. We have a, uh, another channel called Garden Plants with Jim Putnam, and there's a video on this uh, selaginella if you want to uh, go and take a look at that. And the last thing is another funny one. You know, again, I, I'm sitting there saying, well, the hellebores are the perfect thing to go with in this dry shade condition. And then we came in here and planted a fern. <laughs> and the fern is not going to do as well. This is an ostrich fern. Should be about this tall right now. <laughs> it's six inches tall. Uh, this is one that can get kind of out of control. In, and, I've, and I've seen it in areas where it can get out of control. We were just going to plant it back here and let it, you know, give it a little bit of space and then control it when we needed to control it. It's being controlled by a lack of water, <laughs> so don't, don't need to control it thus far. The hookarella you're looking at is called tapestry, probably another one that needs a little bit more moisture, although that, this one's done okay. It's blooming well right now. Uh, pollinators absolutely love these uh, hookara and tiarella crosses, which seem to be honestly a little tougher. Uh, it's, it's strange that you take hookarella and tiarella and put them together and actually end up with a slightly tougher uh, ornamental plant. There's an ajuga uh, behind it called chocolate chip. Several ajuga you'll see in this series of videos. We have lots of ground covers. We've and and looking and looking to add more to reduce our the amount of mulch we're using. The first time we mulched out here, it took I think it was 21 yards of uh, triple shredded hardwood, which is the mulch that we have on the top. And this last time it was down to eight. And uh, I suspect over the next. Uh, you know, year or so, we'll be able to reduce that to six and hopefully less in time using, using ground covers uh, to help out with that. We have a hosta here called Great Expectations, another really, really nice one. Again, these are slightly drier than they would like to be, so they're a little smaller uh, in stature. Uh, you know, we can either leave them here to kind of fight through it, and they'll probably be bigger, better, fuller next year, or we could decide to move them, you know, leave you know, this one will probably just stay in place. It's doing well enough that I think after another year of, you know, putting its roots down, uh, it, it'll be much more vigorous next year. There's a hydrangea behind it with great foliage. This is a Southern Living Plant Collection one. Uh, there was a Southern Living Plant Collection one in the first video as well, uh, that Dear Dolores, which was in full bloom. This one's called Heartthrob. It's a red. Uh, it's just getting started with a few buds on it. I think some got damaged uh, during the winter time. 
Uh, this one just has such good foliage, such a great shape to it. The red flowers are really stunning, and they're red no matter what the soil pH is. That's um, uh, you know, they'll come they'll come out that red color again. Probably could use a little bit of water. There's a yellow calla lily, and this is you know what one of our things where lots of plants in this garden uh, came from other places uh, that uh, you know that were gifted to us or whatever. It's an important part of the story of, of the garden. You know that gardens come gardens should come with stories. This is another one that was dug up from a from a, from a neighbor's yard as a division and was a gift. Um, which we always enjoy. Another one similar to that was this Hemaboa. So we were at, uh, we were doing a video with Mark Wethington from the Ralston at his house, and he talked about Hemaboa. Uh, so he talked about this plant in the video, and then we were down at the Mobile Botanic Garden, saw a Hemaboa in the ground, and Seth, who was on that tour video, uh, went and grabbed one from the greenhouse when we were leaving and gave it to us and so here it is and it's like this story this circular story of two videos we did where we uh, discover an interesting plant that we didn't know would actually grow here it's a plant that i knew about i just didn't think it would grow in our gardens and there it is you know kind of a fun kind of a fun little story with that one as well not going to talk about all the annuals in these videos but we do have another way we're saving on mulch uh, and adding some color and some filler while we wait for these things to fill in our annuals. And so there's some impatience along the edge. We have another one of Dr. Durr's hydrangeas. This one's been in the ground just a bit longer than the other one. And you can see year over year how much more vigorous, you know, than that this one is. It's, it's pink, uh, which is, uh, you know, our pH is low enough that we should have bluer flowers uh, on this, so I don't know if I'm missing aluminum here. I don't know if it just wasn't in the ground long enough to have triggered, you know, uh, getting the right things up from the soil. I have no idea. Uh, this, uh, I will jump over here to this camellia. This camellia is Bella Rouge. This is one of the Southern Living Plant Collections. Uh, camellia Sasanquas. This is a fall blooming camellia. It has a, it's a pink flower, but you could call it red. Uh, you know, it gets pretty close to red. Look at the form on this, how wide and broad it is rather than upright. This is a really great, this is a really great plant for somebody who doesn't want to come in against the sink when it gets 15 feet tall. Uh, this one's easy to keep. Uh, I think I could probably keep this thing below three feet for the next 10 years just because of the what, just because of its growth habit. It'll start setting buds pretty soon. We're here in June. Um, this thing will be blooming by late October to bloom October, November, December, sometimes into January, depends on how, you know, how, how the weather goes during that period of time. But uh, last year it was just absolutely loaded up with, loaded up with flowers. Uh, back here, this is one that everybody loves. This is a podocarpus called Roman Candle. We had another podocarpus in the first video. Uh, if you didn't see that one, this one is a uh, uh, this one's a little slower growing. You know, the one the one in the first video is already, they were planting, you know, think they were the same size when we got them. This one is at two and a half feet. The other one's at five feet and it's already been cut in half one time. Uh, so that'll tell you the difference in growth. When you get these white foliage, uh, variegated plants, they just tend to grow a bit slower, which is fine. This is just a fantastic plant. Uh, I can't recommend this plant enough for those of you in the deep south that can that can grow it. It's not going to be a winter hardy for people in you know colder zones. Although it would be worth putting in a container, honestly, and, and um, going in and out with it during the winter time. I just think it's such a great plant, so showy, a very upright vertical habit ultimately on this plant. It can probably it'll probably end up ten foot tall if we ever let it, and but very very narrow uh, in its habit. I don't think I said the name of the podocarpus. It's Roman candle. I always say Roman candles. I can't help myself but say Roman candles for some reason, but it's actually Roman candle podocarpus. There is a one fern back here that's doing quite well. This is a tassel fern. Needs to pop out, honestly, and go in front. You know, it made sense when it went in here because uh, nothing had any height on it, but now it's kind of hidden back here. As we get further away from the tree and we start to round the corner of the screened in porch, uh, it does get a little more moist going around that way. So this can go that way. Anything that's over here that needs a little more moisture can go that way. Anything that we think will take drier shade, we can flip this way. It's just, again, this is what, this is what you do. You're gonna see areas in the garden that are 
seem more organized than some of the, you know, some other spaces. We are plant collectors, and so we have a lot of one of a kinds out here. It's very hard to landscape. It's very hard to organize them that way. I think Steph does a really good job of laying things out as best she can, considering we bring home one plant on every trip we make out, and then you know, have to find a spot for it that makes sense. And uh, but some of the areas come together and just like wow you and others can tend to you know occasionally something gets hid behind something else and so we'll rearrange things as needed there's a butterfly bush next to me that was already here debonet is what we think the variety is a little doesn't get quite as much light as it would like so it's stretching a bit but it gets it does flower enough and we see hummingbirds on it inside the screen porch here as this gets taller during the summertime all of our butterfly bushes are behind. So this is the first one I think we've gotten to. We're gonna see several. There's one out in the front garden that's on target in full bloom at this point, but the others are all slow to wake up this year. It's just been, so, we've had very cool nights. Another calla lily that needs, actually needs some control added to it, honestly. It's uh, uh, bloomed, like, bloomed like mad. You can see where all the flowers have been cut back on it. Uh, thus far and there is another one it's taking over a bit too much space at this point this is one of those this has become a bull it's gone from beautiful to a little bit of a bully over here so uh, it'll have some control uh, added to it what was the name of that uh hosta that's out i can't see down there stuff okay little devil hosta that little dwarf tiny hosta right there again it should be slightly bigger but it is a small growing one uh, but it's a uh, probably being stunted by being a little bit dry. This is a scent amazing gardenia and it needs some relief from this uh, calla lily. This is a gardenia that has single white, obviously white, but single flowers and but it blooms like mad. That thing almost always has flowers on it. I can see one down in the middle of it right now that's flowered. It's just gone past its first big flowering and it's got tons of buds on it. It's about to open another flush of flowers. Of course, very, very fragrant, very compact habit. Again, it needs a little bit of help um, and relief from this calla lily. There's a hosta down below. This is another one with a story. It's called Strip Tease. We were doing a tour video up in North Raleigh at Lynn Swanson's house. You guys, uh, she was in the video. She was so, so great on the video. They have a giant collection of Japanese maples. We want to go back up there and film at some point. But we admired this hosta and then came up there to shoot a video. We went, visited the garden, then came back to shoot the video and she had dug a piece of it up and sent us home with it. So uh, really love that hosta. It's one of our favorites. And again, it came, it, you know, it's a fond memory from a you know, day spent in someone else's garden. That was the south side of the screen porch. In the first video, we did the screening plants that were along the south side and then of the, of the whole, pro of the, the backyard or the back garden and then you know, that's along the porch and now we're wrapping around what is the west side which normally would be very 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 hot in the summertime but this particular spot does get good sun for a few hours but then there's a giant oak back here that puts it in the shade later on and so there's a definitely a mix of things here that are for the sun and the shade and they work pretty well together uh, because we got the right amount just the right amount for each one uh, so it's working out okay this Wajila is called Shining Sensation. I've, gosh, I've talked about it a lot over the course of three years just because of how amazing this plant actually is. The color holds up so well in it. We, for those of you who live in the north, you know, further north, the dark foliage Wajilas probably come out and bloom and have the great dark foliage all season. For most of the named varieties in the 20 some years that these have been coming out on the market, most of them for us either tried to get 10 feet tall really quickly or they leafed out with this kind of color and then were almost instantly green. Uh, this one really, really holds up in the heat. The flowers were beautiful on it. It's very long bloomed, uh, bright, a bright enough flower to stand out against this foliage color. And it just looks great. There's another Wajila in front of it. Uh, this is a different species, uh, Wajila lumansii, and the variety is called Aura which just means gold uh, or chartreuse or whatever you want to call it. And that's that chartreuse color one doesn't bloom quite as well. It's got a pink and white flower on it, kind of a pinkish white flower. Flowers are nice. It does not get anywhere near as many flowers as Shining Sensation, but then it doesn't need to because look what it looks like afterwards. 
And this is a plant that's definitely gonna try to get taller than the space that it's residing in. We can cut it hard and it'll just flush back out from that. We won't meatball it. We'll go down and follow these uh, down into the plant and cut it back you know, in some, in some way that allows it to still look open and not be meatballed. But again, I think it's a, uh, it's a beautiful combination too between the two Wajilas here. One has much larger leaves than the other one. Uh, which one blooms heavier than the other one. The foliage color is, you know, uh, different. This one has red stems, which is also kind of interesting. Then we have this tree-formed azalea. Uh, this is an encore azalea called debutante. It's bloomed once already. It'll bloom again in the fall. It's really started to take off. Uh, we first put it in the ground here. Uh, it's taken a little while to, you know, get it established, get it rooted in, get it growing well looks great now again it's just finished blooming so you're seeing a little bit of the uh, spent flowers uh, that are in it but it's just a tree formed on azalea uh, and it'll hoping to turn it into a ball about this big something like that and it'll just stick up above these other shrubs that are in here just uh, beside it is a fats hedra this is a combination fats hedra is a combination of fatsia and hedra helix we had a tour group here uh, a week or so ago and this was one of the top plants uh, that was asked about uh, it's just it's so showy i do have it tied up here so it's it's a combination of of english ivy and fatsia japonica it's only been crossed one time ever this was done in like the, in sometime i think it was in the 1800s maybe i'm wrong about that but it was the only time it's ever been done. It was two different genuses that was that were crossed together. I think it's been people have tried since then to do it again. Uh, but it's just a perfect combination of the two because it takes the aggressiveness out of the ivy uh, and actually um, adds a little bit of maybe a little bit of cold tolerance uh, from the uh, from the fats. Yeah, she's right behind you, laying down. <laughs> Holly decided every time Steph is working the camera to lay right behind her uh, as, as she's filming. But this it's just a great plant. It does, again, it has to be tied up so it's not gonna hurt the house in any, any way, shape, or form. Uh, didn't get damaged during that December freeze, except for just a little, not too bad. There's a viburnum down below it. Uh, this is David viburnum. It's very, very happy in this space. These are not always the easiest plants to grow. Uh, we'll keep this one, you know, two to three feet, something like that. I actually saw a couple in Europe that were, you know, six or seven feet tall that were very, very old specimens, heavy, he big, heavy trunks on them. A couple of them, were, they turned into little tree farms, which was super interesting. But one of our, you know, my all-time favorite ornamental plants, just from, not from the ease of growing, <laughs> that's for sure, but certainly from the beautiful foliage it has, uh, flowers as well, but I really grow this thing because of this incredible evergreen foliage. Just in front of the David Viburnum is a variegated radicans gardenia. This is a ground cover gardenia that happens to be variegated. You can see it flowering right now so as the very fragrant white flowers. The flowers tend to be a little bit smaller on radicans than some of the larger growing gardenias, but it's still, you know, it's still flowering. It's still fragrant. This one took a little bit of damage in the winter time. It's not as cold hardy as some of the green, as the green uh, regular green radicans, gardenias, uh, but it's it fought through it. It's got new growth. It's blooming. Again, not going to name all the annuals, the exact variety of the annuals because it, w videos just went up recently, but that right there is a combination of pentas, angelonia, kufia, uh, that are starting to fill in, but they're a little slow. We're, we're well into June here, and you're going to see this uh, the, I showed one annual group in the first video that's quite full at this point, but some of these are definitely behind, and those are um, pentas that she uh, that Steph is getting close to uh, right there. Uh, but again, they're they're definitely behind where they were this time last year. But I don't mind. I mean, I'm out here this morning, and it's actually cool. Uh, Steph has a jacket on, and you know, it's it's at, it's quite cool right here in the middle of almost the middle of June, uh, which is kind of amazing. Uh, this is a boulevard cypress in this container. We're not going to go through all the containers in this series of videos because we just did the container videos as well. But some of these things weren't shown in that. This is a boulevard cypress, second year in this container. Still looks absolutely fantastic. We've got to start being more careful with it now because uh, once it gets root bound in that container, it, if, we're, if we're not watering it, it's going it, to it's gonna thin out quickly on us. I think it's time to, for that thing to go into a... a a new container. 
The, the container behind it has got a really interesting pitosporum in it. Uh, this is a uh, pitosporum that I see. Uh, there's one at the Ralston. There's one down at Juniper Level Botanic Garden. A super underused uh, pitosporum that I hope to see um, more nurseries growing in the future. It was in this container, uh, you know, during a very, very hard freeze. It actually seems to be slightly more cold tolerant than Tiberii, which is uh, Tibera, Tibera, which is the uh, main species of pitosporum that we typically use. It does have a smaller, a, a narrower leaf, but great variegation on it. This spike is absolutely crazy, or Dracaena. Uh, these are, you know, the little spikes that you buy in little three-inch pots that you use in the middle of your containers for the summer and typically let die in the wintertime. They are definitely perennials, and people in the south can keep them year over year. We have absolutely abused this one. It's been in this container for three years, and it's never been protected, really, in any way, shape, or form. It, it, it went through 13 degrees in December. It was 60-some degrees that morning, and then it was 13 degrees of uh, that night and uh, it still survived that without any problem. It's not in the best of shape right this second because it needs a new container or it needs new soil uh, at this point but no plant in this garden has been abused more than this Dracaena has and it's still here and it's got lots of new growth up here on it. Uh, you know I, I'm, I'm kind of amazed by it. it rarely gets watered uh, either. Behind it is a peach that has a story. The peach was in the ground when this project started. I pulled it up out of the ground to rescue it uh, and did an okay job. It actually flushed back out, it finally flushed out nicely, had five or six peaches on it this year. We were about ready to put it back in the ground or put it in a new container or a decorative container and along comes a deer. And a deer came several nights in a row and chomped it back and eaten all but three peaches. So now it's sitting up here on the porch just to protect it from a deer temporarily. Uh, and now it's kind of a start over. <laughs> it took, took two years to get it back to looking semi-normal. And uh, now it's right back where it started, but uh, it'll flush back out. The real star of part two is definitely Holly. <laughs> she's, uh, she's managed to get herself into the uh, video. She loves, we're doing this patio project out here and she loves laying in these moist screenings. I think it's cool. Uh, she's, always, uh, she's always looking for a cool place to lay down. I think this view that you're looking right here looks fantastic. If Steph will swing back around, the first video has a similar spot over there where everything just kind of comes together kind of perfectly. Uh, and then again, this is another view. We have, you know, we're, we're more and more of these views are coming together in the garden where things are filling in and, you know, what you were hoping it was going to look like it now, you know, comes together and looks like. Some other areas you'll see as we go through these tours, we're going to talk about needing to move something around here or there, but it's not that much of it. And more and more, I look out here and see different sections now that become a photo within the bigger picture of the garden, right? You know, just like right there is just a, you know, a, a beautiful snapshot of a larger garden. So there you go. There's the end of round two of the very detailed tour here in the Raleigh, North Carolina garden. Uh, three will be up soon.